Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. We're very excited to be here today because we have with us Ed Caesar, who is an author, journalist, and an award winning writer. He also writes full time for the New Yorker, and his new book, The Moth in the Mountain, is out on the 12th of November. Welcome, Ed. Thank you so much for having me. We are really, really looking forward to this one because I've actually read the book. The book is so well written and really, really interesting. And we're going to be talking, if people don't know what the book is about already, we're going to be talking about Mount Everest and someone very, very, very interesting that tried to get to the top. So before we start about the journey of this incredible man called Morris Wilson, can you tell us a little bit about Mount Everest? Yeah, I mean, the, ba- the basic facts are uh, it's the highest mountain in the world. It's um, in the Himalayas. It's 29,000 feet, a little bit more than 29,000 feet or uh, eight and a half thousand meters. Um, and nobody really had any ideas about climbing it or getting to the top of it until about the turn of the 20th century. So alpinism or mountaineering, as we know, it, is, is pretty modern sport pretty modern idea um and it's really a victorian invention although other people had climbed mountains for sport before then and you know it starts in europe and and goes to various other continents and finally ends up at the highest mountain range in the world the himalayas and it's really in the beginning of the 20th century that you start to see uh, particularly the british um fixing their sights on the top of everest and there are there are three really exciting uh, and kind of mad, adventurous expedition to the mountain in the 1920s, um, and one more in 1933 before um, Wilson had his own go. But really, he was um, he was a pioneer <laughs> in one respect, in that all of those expeditions had dozens of people on them, and he was trying to do it on his own with a little bit of help from uh, a couple of local men who, uh, who who helped him get to the foot of the mountain. So your book starts with the First World War, which obviously makes Alex very happy, of course, um, <laughs> <laughs> our First World War historian. Um, can you tell us about Second Lieutenant Morris Wilson and his experience in the First World War? Yeah, so he was one of four boys who grew up in Bradford, and he joined up on his 18th birthday in 1916, and it took him a while to see action on the front line but when when he eventually arrived in uh in france he first of all went got on a train and just caught the end of the uh battle of passchendaele um in 1917 uh and that horrific last new year on the front line um and his battalion were the first fifth west yorkshire regiment were sort of swapping positions on the front line um, in shell holes with rotting bodies all around them uh, and really terrible weather. And um, well, Wilson's involved in this incredible action during the spring offensive of 1918, which is when the Germans were trying to break through the British lines and settle the war decisively before America came in on the Allied side and settled it decisively in the Allied favour. And he was involved in this day at a place that the troops called White Sheet, which is near a Belgian town called Witschet. And uh, more than 500 of his uh, members of his battalion were killed on that day, about 150 taken prisoner. No officer from A, B or C company of his battalion survived. Wilson was one of the only people who survived and in fact did so in the most remarkable way. Um, with this act of gallantry that won him the military cross. He was isolated uh, in front of the the front line, raked on all sides, as his MC citation goes, by machine gun fire, and he kept on firing on the enemy. Um, And it was owing to his heroics that the German attack was held up a little bit, and um, he was eventually able to regroup with the remnants of his battalion and various other battalions from Leeds, from Bradford, and uh, the German attack was ultimately unsuccessful, didn't make the high ground. And that was partly down to his heroics. But, but those experiences 
never left him really he never he never got over what happened to him on the front line and um you know even 16 years later at the foot of everest he was still thinking about what happened to him in flanders at this point he already seems like an incredibly remarkable person yeah i think in truth i think he was probably um one of a number of you know people at that stage who if the war had not come along might have lived quite an ordinary life you know he was um he was the son of a uh, a mill owner in in bradford and you know his life was going to be probably in textiles working with his dad like his brothers um i think he could have had a you know an unremarkable life a, a life um not noted in the history books had it not been for the first world war and the fact is he was he found himself to be incredibly courageous under fire but also as he must have known he was so lucky to survive you know it really was a matter of luck who caught a shell and who didn't who caught a machine gun bullet and who didn't and that sense of having dodged a bullet both you know literally and um figuratively stayed with him and he and he didn't know quite what to do with that um and i think that's the seed of where everything else in his life comes comes from he you know he often got himself into scrapes and often found himself through sheer luck um courage bullheadedness able to get through to the other side so let's fast forward just a tiny bit so post for yeah. life uh, everyone knows it wasn't easy because there was a lack of work etc when does he decide to leave the uk because he does decide to do that where does he go and what happens in those six years while he's away so yeah he in 1923 he gets on a ship to new zealand and um his business hasn't gone well but when he's back in bradford he's miserable his dad dies um he's married to a woman who doesn't seem to make him very happy and he leaves her behind with the idea that she's going to catch up with him in new zealand when he's um set himself up in business so he gets on a ship with his little brother Stanley and goes off to New Zealand. And by the time his wife Beatrice arrives in New Zealand, he's found another woman, um, a remarkable woman who owns her own uh, uh, dressmaking business called Mary Garden in New Zealand. And he leaves his wife, jilts her without enough money for her return boat home. She has to sue him for divorce in New Zealand. Um, it's pretty shameful behavior by him and, and Beatrice never forgets it for the rest of her life. Um, and he stays in New Zealand with Mary Garden. They have a somewhat, uh, you know, luxurious life because she's made some money. He's making money in, the, in her dress business, but he's soon pretty miserable and, and that marriage dissolves as well. And then he finds himself, you know, in 1930 in the grip of the Great Depression, in his own depression, leaving his wife, traveling back home to England with another woman on a ship via Vancouver through Northwest uh, United States to California, then back cross country uh, on his own as far as Chicago, St. John, New Brunswick. And eventually he, he finds his way back into uh, the United Kingdom, uh, arrives in the Liverpool docks in 1931, um, totally in the in the grip of uh, what we would now I think describe as kind of late onset PTSD. He describes his mental state as being very topsy turvy, um, which is the kind of euphemism that uh, you know you can understand what was going on with him. Um, but yeah, he's 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 trying to understand what to do with his life, and he's completely lost the thread of his own story. I'm assuming due to the PTSD, he's just just not happy. He can't find happiness. Yeah, he's, you know, he, he talks about um, trying to find help for his depression with doctors in America. Um, he's seemingly unable to fix on a relationship, uh, to stay in a relationship. Uh, he has you know, no sense of what he should be doing with his life. And I, and I think that this is the moment when he, um, after another failed adventure, when he gets back into London and he goes to South Africa and Mozambique um, with another woman called Kathleen Dix, 
and eventually comes back to London and uh, he falls into this um, sense that he's got to have a bold and bright new adventure and it takes him a while to work out what that is. So this is where his uh, spiritual awakenings come into into play. Let's talk about those. Yeah, so the, so this is probably going to be um, a contentious bit of the book because you know there's there's been some things written about Wilson before where um, he's described as having a uh, a sort of Christian a, a Christian awakening, you know. So he he and you know, it's almost like an, a, an evangelist or born again Christian awakening. I think it's a little bit more complicated than that. He he was certainly influenced during that very low period in his life in 1932 by 1931 and 1932 by um, the Oxford group of Christians who um, were ve- were then making their way in London, um, having um, started in America, and um, the Oxford group had a big influence later on, um, you know, the central tenets of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, they believed in submission uh, to God's will. Um, and there are elements of things like new thought and, um, you know, being being su- submissive to God's will and also um, having a sense that, you know, the world is suffused by uh, God's love. And so, so that is all, that's all, that is all definitely an influence on Wilson. Um, unusually for a Christian, he loves going out to nightclubs and dancing all night, and he loves the horses. <laughs> he loves uh, all of those other kind of more, um, uh, you know, uh, less abstemious things. But he get he gets interested in fasting and prayer, and he thinks that sort of semi regular fasts can purify him. But he's also absolutely interested in a kind of thinly understood eastern mysticism so um gandhi comes to uh, london in 1931 and draws huge crowds wherever he goes and is written about in the papers almost every day and gandhi is for wilson a very um interesting figure and is definitely someone that he paid a lot of attention to um and of course gandhi was known to fast for political reasons, but I think a combination of the kind of Christian awakening and also um, an interest in Eastern mysticism, um, Wilson becomes very interested in uh, Blavatsky um, and, and those writings. So he he's a kind of hodgepodge of spiritual ideas that were on vogue in London at that time. And it's during one of these fasts and reawakenings that he that he hits upon the idea to to um to try and get to the top of everest the fasting is quite reoccurring in your book i've noticed yeah i mean he's you know j- just you know he and he's very extreme about the fast you know like he he talks about <laughs> rolling over in bed and almost tearing the bed sheets which is just a like terrifying image um by the time he arrives in germany in 1932 um, after one of his long fasts, you know, he, he's so thin that none of his clothes fit him and his trousers almost fall around his ankles. Um, he really did believe in it, you know, and he took it very seriously. He thought that you could um, you could purify your body through fasting, but then seemingly would um, bounce back and, and eat, you know, uh, eat normally and go on long walks and get very fit and so he was this odd mixture of um, different influences but I, th- I certainly think that he he enjoyed um, he enjoyed kind of getting outside of his body for a time and actually I was, t- I was talking to a war correspondent who suffered from PTSD um, recently who had read the book and he said there's it's almost exactly a mirror of how I felt after I left Iraq, having spent a few years in Iraq covering the conflict there. Like I would do anything to sort of get outside of, you know, the limits of my own body. You just want to escape yourself for a bit. And you can see some of that um, drive in, in Wilson. So in 1933, the Brits decide to uh, assemble a new Everest team to scale up that mountain. 
Wilson does something. Yeah. What does he do? So he's so he he has this idea in Germany that he wants to become the first person to get to the top of Everest. And his first idea is that he's going to try to get a lift in an aeroplane with um, an expedition called the Houston Mount Everest expedition, which was this uh, airborne um, expedition to take photographs at the top of Everest, to fly over the top of Everest and take photographs. Uh, and some of the photographs from that, if anyone wants to go and look at them, are absolutely astonishing. These pilots flew from Pernir in, in northern India and flew over the top of Everest and took these remarkable photographs. And so he has this idea that he, he, he wants to ask them to, uh, if he can come with them, and essentially parachute onto Everest to then climb to the top. And he soon realises that this is a ridiculous idea he'll probably die. It's not going to be permitted in the first place. So he shelves that. But the idea of a flight to Everest stays with him. And so he um, buys an aeroplane, a gypsy moth, uh, and learns how to fly it. Um, at the same time, the 1933 expedition led by a man named Hugh Rutledge um, is getting ready to try to climb Everest themselves uh, in 1933. And they've got brilliant and experienced alpinists in that group, people like Frank Smythe. And so they set off for the mountain uh, in 1933. And Wilson is very worried that they're going to get to the top and beat him to the top of the mountain. Um, because his, his new plan is essentially to, to fly his plane, land it on a plateau near Everest, and then climb to the top. And uh, as it turns out, uh, the race is in even close. The 1933 expedition don't reach the top, although Frank Smythe gets very, very close, um, climbing uh, first of all with a partner and then on his own. And he becomes so delirious near the top that he offers to share his biscuits with an imaginary companion and then eventually survives and, and makes his way down. But the, but the 1933 team uh, don't make it to the top of Everest. Um, leaving the the way open seemingly for Wilson. I've got to say his idea sounds amazing on paper. In practice, <laughs> maybe not so much. I mean, he was an ideas guy. Like he, you couldn't fault his ambition. Um, you know, he had these grand ideas always. And in fact, you know, one of, one of the things that I fell in love with with Wilson, I imagine he could have been nightmarish to live with. Um, difficult, bombastic, um, full of, you know, talk and, you know, schemes and what have you. But like, you cannot fault the way that he saw the world. He, 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 he eventually saw things as just, you know, obstacles that willpower alone could overcome. You know, he thought, well, why can't I parachute onto Everest and climb to the top? You know, what's, what could possibly go wrong? Everything. Everything. <laughs> <laughs> So how does he prepare for his expedition, apart from fasting? Fast, he does a lot of uh, he does a lot of training uh, to get you know physically fit. He walks long distances. He walks from London to Bradford at least twice. He doesn't do a lot of um, mountain climbing, but he does a lot of hill walking. So he's a completely inexpert mountain climber. He's got no experience. He doesn't know how to cut ice steps. Doesn't doesn't know how to use an ice axe never use crampons, uh, but he does a lot of walking in the, in the Lake District and in Snowdonia. And uh, he does a parachute jump to test his nerve. He learns how to fly his plane. He buys all the best equipment that he can, a lot of it from Fortnum and Mason, uh, uh, which supplied many of the early Everest expeditions. And so he's you know, he's an intelligent reader and he reads every single newspaper article and book that he can get his hands on about Everest. Um, but the truth is that in order to climb mountains, you need to have climbed some mountains. And, you know, in order to climb Everest, you know, it's probably best to start on something that is slightly lower. And Wilson had never done any of that. And, and that eventually um, was going to be a problem for him. I love that. Like I said, Amazing on paper, in practice, not so good. Yeah. But, you know, his, he was totally adamant 
that one person with, uh, you know, a light load could reach the top of Everest. What he saw actually correctly in the early ex Everest expeditions were enormous parties of, you know, British uh, and Commonwealth climbers uh, with dozens of porters, you know, huge trains of luggage, um, you know, making their way to the mountain with these on this very long schedule, you know, uh, three months from London to the foot of the mountain, at least, um, you know, carrying crates full of the most ridiculously ornate things. You know, they, the 1924 expedition brought, you know, um, dinner plates and carving knives and, uh, you know, cases of Montebello 1915 champagne with them. There was foie gras. The, you know, it was just an extraordinary um, amount of things that you actually didn't need to climb a mountain that they took with them. And what Wilson recognized correctly was that if you were less weighed down by all this, you know, this caravan of luggage and all these people that you had to look after, you could make a lot more headway. And it was a style called the Alpinist style that uh, Reinhold Messner, the greatest high mountain uh, Alpinist of all time, later developed and was completely expert at. Um, the trouble was you needed to be a really good climber for it to work and Wilson wasn't. I don't want to, I mean, I love Wilson. I really do. And the way he thinks and even, even his bad behavior, but it's a bit like me saying, Oh, you know, I can swim in the swimming pool. I'm going to try and swim the channel. It is a little bit like that, except he really, you know, does get a very long way <laughs> without, without, you know, without spoiling the book. Like he's, you know, you, you think that he should, um, you know, every time he comes up against something, you think that's got to be the end for him. But in fact, what you realize is, you know, he gets a long way. Like he's, you know, willpower will get you a huge part of the way. And he's, and he's no dummy either. So he, he does, he's at least um, clever. He speaks languages. He gets on with people. Uh, he's fit. You know, that is half the battle. It's not the whole battle, but it is, you know, well, it's more than half the battle. So the day is set, which is supposed to be his birthday, 21st of April. Yeah. Not everything quite goes according to plan, does it? No, he crashes his plane uh, before a couple of days before he's meant to go <laughs> set off for Everest. Um, hits a hedge near his hometown of Bradford and uh, ends up upside down, suspended in his harness. And a local boy has to help him out. I mean, amazingly, he's unhurt in this crash, but his plane needs repairs. So he's, he's delayed until, until May. Um, but he's completely undeterred from his, his mission, despite this mishap. And he, you know, he, he sets his, his date again for May. You know, in the meantime, the Air Ministry and various other civil service uh, bodies are at, become absolutely determined to stop Wilson getting to Everest. So he has, he has the world against him in that, you know, the British authorities, both, you know, in Britain and in India, do not want this seemingly uh, reckless Englishman with no official permission and with, you know, no permit to fly over Nepal, with no... Um, you know, permission to go near the mountain. Uh, they do not want him to wreck various bits of diplomacy in which they're now engaged by doing something like crashing in Nepal or um, causing a scene. And so they deter him at every single opportunity. They try to turn him back before he starts. They send him cables on no account are you to depart. And he just disregards all of it, um, gets in his plane on... Uh, 21st of May and sets off for the Himalayas. You've got to love his determination, right? Yeah, I mean, I just love the idea of him getting an official cable from the British government. On no account are you to proceed. And him telling the journalist, the gloves are off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do. I, he is just such an awesome guy. He's someone I'd love to have a drink with, I think. Yeah, and I think, you know, he probably 
probably you'd probably regret that decision at three o'clock in the morning. But um, he's a, you know, the, there was nothing. There's something quite interesting about how low he became before he set out on this exuberant, larger than life mission. You know, he was he was at absolute rock bottom. And I think it was because of that, that he felt that he didn't have anything to lose. You know, ever, ever, you know, everything in his life was pointing towards Everest. And that was what he was going to do, you know, come hell or high water. So second time lucky. Um, yeah. Run us through his journey to Nepal, because from the modern perspective, you'd be like, oh, yeah. So he just jumped a plane straight over into Asia. But it's not as simple as that, is it? No, you can, you can only fly so far in a single hop in a gypsy moth. So normal range is about 300, 350 miles with extra fuel tanks, which he had installed in the front. You could just at a push get over 700 miles um, in a single stretch without refueling. So he's got to plot his journey. And it's just magical, this, this journey that he takes in his plane. So he goes, if I get it completely right, Stag Lane Aerodrome in North London, Clear Customs at Heston, uh, Freiburg in Germany, uh, Marseille, uh, Pisa, uh, Rome, Naples, Catania in Sicily, and then into North Africa, um, Tripoli, uh, Benghazi. He's going across the um, the North African, sh- going along the North African shoreline all the way to Cairo. Um, you know, through the Middle East, um, hopping down through the Trucial States, Bahrain. Um, he's, he's almost turned back in uh, Bahrain, or he's, he's ordered to turn back in Bahrain by uh, a British official called Gordon Locke, who makes him sign a, a document saying he's going to fly back by Iraq um, through Europe and home. Um, and he promises Locke that he's going to do it. Um, so that he can get some more fuel and he gets the fuel starts his plane goes up into the sky instead of turning left towards Iraq and home he turns right and uh, goes all the way to Gwadar Karachi he's in India Um, so he makes it 5,000 miles um, in you know in contravention of um, all all the sense of you know he's he's going to be flying for about two months and there's no way he should make it. Um, you know, he just doesn't have the experience to make it. He's in a secondhand gypsy moth, but somehow he gets through many different scrapes, slips and slides, and he makes it to India in a couple of weeks. It's all about luck, really, isn't it? Which is exactly what you said at the beginning. Yeah, it's luck. And, you know, he rides his luck um, many times. You know, there's... There's also that just the sense of someone who someone who is absolutely determined to do something is very hard to stop. You know, he you know really most people would have turned back at least at Bahrain. You know, in in Baghdad he realizes he can't get through um, Persia because his permit's been lost. So you know he has to tear a a page out of an old school atlas he finds in a Baghdad bazaar so he can find another route to to go on. You know, I mean. It is, it is as much to do with determination as it is to do with luck. But yes, he does get very lucky. So the first part of the mission is now complete. Yeah. Now the mountain is left. And it doesn't quite go according to plan, does it? No. So, he, so his idea was to get to Pernir in northern India and to fly across Nepal and you know, start, his, uh, start his climb from, from essentially the foot of Everest where he's going to have landed his plane. But by the time he gets to India, you know, he's giving interviews to the Daily Express. Everyone knows about his uh, adventure. The Air Ministry are pretty peeved that he's, um, you know, that he did what he did in, um, in Bahrain uh, and defied them. So, there's, so there are all kinds of pressures on him. And by the time he gets to... Pernir, his plane is impounded by the authorities there. And essentially that's the end of his, the flying part of his journey. He, he ends up um, 
you know, trying to entreat the Maharaja of Nepal to let him fly across Nepal, but the British authorities get in the way and they say, there's no way this is happening. And so eventually he, he sells his plane um, and starts to think of another way to get to the mountain. So the, the way that all the expeditions of the 1920s and the expedition of 1933 got to the mountain was they got to Darjeeling by, uh, you know, by ship and then by train. And then they trekked north through Sikkim uh, into Tibet, uh, west and then south to the foot of Everest from the, from the northern side to the Rongbuk Monastery. And Wilson decides to do the same. So he doesn't have permission to enter Tibet, which you really need. Um, and so he decides to take his luck. He's he, um, take his chances. He's going to, he gets to Darjeeling in the autumn of 1933. And then uh, spends a winter there because he realizes that Everest is unclimbable except in the spring. And after some negotiations with, uh, with some uh, Sherpas who've been on the 1933 expedition, he, he, he has three people who are going to come with him to uh, the foot of Everest. And in order to uh, steal away from Darjeeling, um, where he's being watched by uh, British officials. Um, he disguises himself as a Tibetan priest and sneaks out at midnight out of Darjeeling, having paid his hotel room six months in advance. So we're at this stage now where he is finally, finally going to get his chance. Does it all go to according to plan? None of this ever goes according to plan, does it? No, although the, the, the one bit of the, the one bit of, of the adventure where he really does excel is this uh, trek from Darjeeling to, to the mountain. You know, a lot of it is undertaken at night um, to evade detection and he sleeps in his tent during the day. And because he's so fit, he's done all this walking, um, he's lean, uh, he's determined. They don't have huge numbers of, uh, uh, porters he's you know he's essentially carrying a lot of his climbing equipment himself um but they they make really really fast progress to everest and they cover huge amounts of ground and it, and his diary from this period shows how happy this period of his life makes him like this is as happy as he ever seems to be when he's got his goal set n nothing in his way He's in, in the grip of this huge adventure. You know, the, the way that he writes about Tibet um, is wonderful. And he, he experiences this swell of fellow feeling with uh, the local people that he meets. And that to me is quite poignant. He's, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's almost happiest um, just in a moment bef before his, his, the final part of his mission. Um, and his, you know, his diary talks about, you know, poor civilized saps back in London rushing around chasing after gold and getting nowhere while he's doing something really beautiful on the roof of the world. Shall we tell our listeners what happens while he goes up the mountain? Or would you like to leave it as a <laughs> sort of how many? Well, what I will say is. <laughs> Yeah, I think I might. I think I might leave a little bit of mystery. I will. What I will say is that he he makes two attempts, and the first one is an unmitigated disaster. He hardly gets, you know, anywhere where he needs to be, but he but he learns a lot in that experience, and and he persuades a couple of the porters to come with him at, on the second attempt as far as the foot of the North Coal, and uh, where he finds the 1933 food dump, which includes uh, an extraordinary number of uh, wonderful things from Fortnum and Mason, uh, you know, uh, King George chocks and uh, pate and um, various other delights, which um, one of my favorite things to imagine is uh, Wilson finding all this stuff and spending the next day happily gorging himself on goodies from uh, Fortnum and Mason in Piccadilly. 
I would so, love to be doing that right now, personally. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, so I love that idea. Um, and what you will, what what everyone listening will know is that Morris Wilson did not reach the top of Everest. Um, but I might just leave a little bit of mystery about what happens when he gets to the North Pole on the second on the second time. Um, that, so yeah, that's that's where I might leave it. But suffice to say that you know. No one expected him to make it much past Stag Lane uh, when he first got into his plane. And, you know, he was for a time the highest human being um, on the planet, which makes me feel uh, quite good about him. So he did, he achieved quite a lot, actually, especially during that time. He achieved a huge amount. I mean, the the question you've got to ask is, you know, to what end, um, you know, which gets to a kind of, you know, it's a difficult question about mountaineering or polar exploration or whatever. And it was, it was a question, I think, that, um, you know, got answered quite tritely by George Mallory, famous alpinist, you know, he was asked why try and climb Everest. And he said, because it's there. But, but that wasn't, that's not quite a good enough <laughs> reason. I, th- I, th- I think for the you know, the truth is that for a lot of a lot of that generation who had fought in the First World War, Everest did become a symbol of something pure and good, and a challenge that seemed to uh, to respond to the you know the highest virtues um, that they as they saw it, you know, courage and and forbearance and and they they saw Everest as being this sentinel, and there was a redemptive quality. You know, I. I think about Wilson's journey to Everest as a pilgrimage of some kind. And, it, and it's very clear to me that, you know, he, he had burned a lot of bridges and there was no real way that he wanted to come back defeated from the mountain. You know, the, this for him was essentially the, the, you know, his life's work, you know, it, it's, it gave purpose to his life. Um, a life that had, was coming apart, had come apart, um, really, for his whole adulthood. So that, to me, is the you know the meaning of Everest in the in the twenties and thirties for these men. You know, it's really striking to see how many of the people in the twenties had fought uh, on the Western Front, and for Wilson, you know, when he when he catches sight of the mountain. You know, one of the thoughts that runs through his head is 16 years since I went into the line in France for stunt, by which he means 16 years ago, I was just about to, you know, uh, I was just about to go into battle. And I, you know, I find all that instructive about his state of mind. He was, you know, he was trying to redeem himself with this great, absolutely wild adventure. Um, and you know his his diary entries and his letters home were full of humor and um, sensitivity and you know he's deeply in love with his best friend's wife and and all of that comes through um, but his sense of mission is 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 really something you know uh, we might look at alpinism or mountaineering as somewhat pointless risk taking but it wasn't it was definitely it definitely wasn't pointless or self-centered. I suppose it was self-centered, but it definitely wasn't pointless to, to Wilson. It was, it was this, um, it was an attempt to fill this, this hole inside of himself. You've just touched on my next question uh, about the letters. Oh, good. I want to know, because on this podcast, we are amazing geeks and we always, always want to know where and how did you manage to find all these amazing sources? So, um, this was a re- this book was a real struggle in terms of original source material because there had been things written about Wilson in the past. There was one book written in the nineteen fifties by a journalist uh, called Dennis Roberts, um, and Dennis Roberts had seen these letters that Wilson had written home to Enid, who was his soulmate and, um, you know, who he was desperately in love with. 
and that informed a lot of his of Roberts's book but they do not appear the letters themselves did not appear in the book because of a deal that Roberts struck with um, his sources it was kind of be disgraceful you know to put, put these things into the public domain while the people who'd written them were still alive but um, a German author called Peter May Hussing who's written about Wilson uh, in German um, bought the letters off Dennis Roberts just before he died um, and Peter May Hussing kept them in his basement uh, in a in a house in Bremen in northern Germany and um, said that if I was um, happy enough to travel to Bremen I could have them and I bought him lunch and that was all the payment he needed um, for handing over this gold so that was that was one amazing um, sort of stroke of luck or bit of detective work that I had and that, and then the other thing that I think has really changed since you know anyone last wrote about Wilson is that just this sheer number of ways in which you can uh, in which travel has been digitized you know through various different sites but you know ships manifests uh, extraordinary resource because you can just see where Wilson was you can plot his journeys around the world um, you can absolutely refute um, various bits of um, you know gospel that have been written about him because you know that he can't have been um, in a certain place at a certain time or he was traveling on a ship around the other side of the world um, so that was that was really interesting and I guess like one of the mo one of the most revealing um, aspects of the research to me was the first world war stuff you know Roberts had um, Roberts had Wilson fighting in a completely different part of the Western Front when he won his military cross, being injured in a completely different part of the Western Front. And I couldn't, for the life of me, see how his battalion could be in that place at that time. And so I worked with a couple of other historians um, who, you know, someone at the York Army Museum provided me with a, uh, a lot of the unit diaries and um, other um, original sources about what Wilson's battalion would be up to and I also um, you know I also worked with a, a brilliant historian called John Sheehan who did a book called the Harrogate Terriers uh, about Wilson's battalion and through all of that sort of original and, and secondary material was absolutely sure about what had happened to Wilson in the um, in the First World War and once you know that he fought at Vitschate on the 25th of April, 1918, and once you know how dramatic and uh, extraordinary that action was, it changes everything that you think about Wilson because he, he, he was involved with something, you know, so distressing. He was involved in something where 500 of his friends were gone forever. Um, and no one would ever really recover from that. Um, and I guess the, you know, on that wartime theme, you know, the one, the one thing that I really wanted to do with this book was to really see where Wilson came from in terms of his background and what his family were doing during all this time. And I found this amazing, you know, the National Archives had his brothers, um, not only their wartime records, but their, their post-service medical records. And, you know, he, uh, Wilson's brother Victor suffered the most extraordinary um, neurasthenia post-traumatic stress after the First World War you know shaking he couldn't sleep his eyelids trembled uh, he was considered at least 80% disabled on account of this neurasthenia um, by the army medical boards and all of that's just sitting there you know had never been looked at uh, as far as I could see in the um, National Archives um, and so you start to see the trauma is not just being Wilson's, but being family wide. Um, you know, it, this was a this was a conflict that affected um, cities where there were PALS battalions particularly badly. So, you know, when Wilson became um, first, you know, became a soldier, it, it was about two weeks before the Battle of the Somme, a day on which you know nearly two thousand people from the Bradford Powell's battalions 
were killed and his you know his street alone uh, there were six or seven young men who had never come back and it, you, you see these things as being traumatic not just individually but on a you know on a city-wide and on a family-wide basis and that, and that really was um that was really you know integral to understanding him so today we've only literally just scratched the surface there is so much more so many more details in your book and so much more information about uh wilson and his journey and his family and his experiences that you guys who are listening seriously go out the book is out in a couple of weeks make sure you grab yourselves a coffee because i really enjoyed it and i'm sure you guys will too so before we finish Ed, tell us where our listeners can find your book and just remind them of the title again. So the book is called The Moth and the Mountain. And uh, I'm hoping that it's in every bookshop. <laughs> but for the 12th of November, for the 12th of November, you can, you know, you can buy it anywhere you buy your books. Um, and I hope that many people will do so. And don't forget, check your local bookstores because we're going to try and keep the local book. bookstores. Yes. So let's hope that they let's are in the local bookstores. So <laughs> amazing! I've heard, for, I've heard, for, I've heard, I've heard from lots of local bookstores that uh, say they're getting them in. So that's that's really good news. And um, anyone, you know, any one of those bookstores will take a, uh, you know, will will, t- will take an order from you. So um, yeah, go Indies. There we go. Support our local bookstores. Ed, listen, thank you so much. That was so insightful. I love the book and um, I can't wait for other people to start reading it. So thank you so much. You're so kind. Thanks so much. Join us tomorrow when the fabulous Ian Dale will be with us to talk all about his new book, uh, which he has edited together. And it is basically the history of Britain's prime ministers in one book, all 55 of them, uh, bioed by the people that know them best and put together by Ian. And we have some fun going through the list with him and picking out some of his favourites and least favourites and talk about why they make those lists. So don't miss that. And then in the afternoon, evening, we're off down the pub again. Uh, We have had two rampant, sexy weeks of nonsense with lots of smart in them uh trying to dial it down a bit this week we have gone for history's worst idea and i have uh given them a very open remit and not specified anything in particular in terms of what that means so we could end up with all manner of nonsense so join us for that don't forget that we do exist on patreon as History Hack, and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, but life is going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join, there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up history hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year we are now on youtube we are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms so you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time so do go over there and subscribe